So in the next hour and a half, I am hoping to get through two more chapters. I realize that that's an ambitious goal. And uh, I think the first of the two chapters is probably the more meaty one. Uh, although I hope that it's also rather familiar to many of you from functional programming because <clears throat> it is really just, we're, we're not going to introduce very much new about proving things in Coq in this chapter. It's really just about programming with polymorphism, which is something that one uses a lot, uh, obviously, in Coq as in any functional language. So I'm going to try to go through this chapter fairly fast and depend on you to slow me down <clears throat> if there's anything that is not clear. So we defined already a type of lists of numbers. If we want to have a type of lists of Booleans and lists of pairs and lists of lists, we're going to end up writing a lot of new definitions and it's going to be very annoying. So instead, we should not do that. We should write one single definition for the type of lists of anything. And here's how it looks. The interesting part is that uh, the type list is now not a type, it's a type family so-called, or a type operator, or a function from uh, types to types. So list takes an argument, which is a type, <clears throat> and when given an argument, it describes a type, namely the type of, uh, of lists whose elements are drawn from the type that it's applied to. So we can even, so everything in Coq is typed. List has a type, and its type is type arrow type. Of course. <clears throat> now, in this definition, it's not obvious what the types of nil and cons are anymore. Because uh, nil, for example, has an x in its type. So if, we, if you see a nil somewhere in a program, how do you know what x it is? Well, nil also becomes a function taking a type as an argument. So, uh, so if we check, uh, so nil applied to nat is a list of nats, and cons applied to nat and a number and a list of nats gives us a list of nats. Nil itself has type for all x, list of x, where x is a type. What else could it be? Cons has type for all x, x, arrow list of x, arrow list of x. Okay, now we can go back and we, we can redefine all of our functions like repeat and length and append and so on uh, to take an extra argument that indicates the type of the things in the list that they, uh, that they operate over. So the repeat function takes, first of all, a type x. Then it takes little x, whose type is x. And then it takes count, whose type is number still, and it returns a list of x's. And when we, when we call cons, when we call nil, and when we call repeat, when we make the recursive call to repeat, in each case, we need to supply all of the arguments, including x. Let's see, I'm going to skip that and ask you, mm, yeah, so think to yourself for a second, what is the type of repeat? If we said check repeat, what, what would we see? Ah, question on the previous slide. Um, Please. Yep. What's the difference between saying for all x comma type and just saying x arrow? Ah. <clears throat> so, what's the difference between this for all x and this x arrow? They are completely different <laughs> in a sl slightly subtle way. So, this says there's an argument to this function, cons, uh, that is a type, so it should belong to the set of types, and I'm giving it a name x, 
so that I can use it later. Here, I'm using the previously bound name x to say the second argument to the cons constructor should belong to the set described by x, whatever it is. So whatever x you supply as the first argument, you should supply as the second argument an element of x. Other questions? Okay, so back to my question for you. What is the type of repeat? I'll give you five choices down at the bottom. Number four. So for all x, x, arrow net, arrow list x. Yes, and we can, re and we can read that off basically from the, uh, the first line with one bit of knowledge, which is that, uh, that when we bind a type parameter, uh, well, uh, to be more careful, when we bind a parameter whose name we're going to use later on in the type, so we're gonna need to mention x here and here, uh, we bind it with for all uh, rather than writing type arrow. So this, this almost means type arrow. The only difference is that we're, we're mentioning a name x so that we can use the very value that was, uh, that was supplied as the first parameter as the type of the second parameter and the type of the elements of the result. <clears throat> so you might ask yourself, if for all and arrow mean almost the same, could I write this one as for all little x of type big X? Yes, you can totally do that. It's a little silly to do that because little x isn't needed anywhere here. We don't need to mention it. Uh, but if you want, you can perfectly well write it that way. Uh, is type, like with this capital T, is that like a super type of? Yeah, we'll get back to that. So, uh, so what is this? capital T type. Uh, it, is, um, it is a collection of things, namely the collection of things that can be used to classify values like trees and functions and things like that at the first level. So, uh, so is it yet again an element of a yet higher level collection? Of course. Uh, that's something that we don't really need to get into for present purposes, but as you go further along in Koch, it will be important that there is indeed a hierarchy of so-called universes, uh, and this one that we're calling type uh, is the bottom layer of that hierarchy. Is that universe zero? Or is uh, it is universe zero, I believe. <laughs> uh, it's a little bit complicated down at the bottom of the hierarchy uh, because there is, uh, there is type, there's type, type zero and set, uh, and two of those are the same, which is it? I believe type and type zero are the same. So if I say check type and get type? Yes, and if you turn on uh, the printing of universes, you might even get type zero. Uh, no, probably you get type one if you, uh, if you check type. Uh, okay, so the answer was four. <clears throat> and skip over that, okay. Now, if we stopped there, uh, and just started programming, we would end up writing a lot of types all over the place. And it would be a little bit annoying because it's really easy to work out the fact that, um, that for example, the, uh, the second argument to repeat has to have the type that's described by the first argument to repeat. And, uh, and count must be a number and things like that. You can just see it from uh, just analyzing in a shallow way the, the syntax of the program. Count must be a number because we pattern match against it and the cases, uh, the, the constructors that we mention are uh, zero and s um, and, uh, and so on. And, uh, and capital X must be a type because it's, the, it's used as the first argument to cons. So it's really easy to work out uh, what the types of those things are, also what the result type is of this, uh, of this whole thing because the result here is a nil and the result here is a cons. So, Koch allows you to omit 
quite a bit of type information. In general, you can attempt to omit all type annotations everywhere. And, uh, and often that will work. Sometimes it won't. So unlike ML and Haskell, so ML and Haskell, uh, the description of uh, what types can be inferred is fairly simple because the, uh, the algorithm that infers them is just first order unification. It's a fairly simple algorithm that, that reconstructs the missing type information. In Coq, the, uh, the algorithm that fills in the missing information is much more complicated and subtle. And therefore, the circumstances under which you can successfully omit type information are a little harder to describe. However, a good first approximation is <clears throat> if you think you ought to be able to omit it because you could in ML or Haskell, then you probably can. So here we can omit the types in the declaration. I wouldn't actually omit those because I think they're good as documentation. It's the other ones that I really want to omit. So can we do that? Yes. Uh, in the following way. So first of all, any place you don't feel like writing a type, you can write an underscore instead. And the underscore is just an indication to Koch that something goes here, but I'm not telling you what it is. I want you to try to infer it. And if it can, then everything is happy. And if it can't, then you'll get an error message and, and you can fill it in. So here, I've replaced all of the type arguments to the constructors and to the recursive call of repeat uh, with underscores and everything works. For the same reason that it works in, in ML or Haskell. You can go a step further and say, I don't even want to put in the underscores because even the underscores are a little bit annoying. So can I omit the underscores? Yes, I can say, every time you see nil, it has one argument and because of the curly braces, the curly braces are saying to Koch, I want you to infer that argument every time you see nil. I just want you to put an underscore after it. And every time you see cons, I want you to put uh, an underscore here, but not here and here. All right, so, the, so it's the curly braces. I know it's a little confusing. The underscore usually means fill it in. But in the arguments declaration, it means don't fill it in. The curly braces mean fill it in. Uh, and for repeat, fill in the first argument and don't fill in the others. <clears throat> here, here the underscore just means I'm not bothering to give a name to a pattern variable. Uh, okay, so now we can use cons without a type argument. And that's good. And indeed, if we don't feel like writing all of these uh, arguments declarations, we can do it all at once. So here is the definition of repeat again, uh, where now the first argument, the type argument, is enclosed in curly braces, not parentheses. And that's a signal to, to Koch that says, uh, whenever you see repeat, tick, 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 uh, you should automatically fill in uh, an underscore for the first argument, including in the recursive call here. Now we can define polymorphic versions of some other functions, blah, blah. There's one situation where, uh, well, there are many situations. There's one very common one where omitting type arguments is actually not the right thing. And that is in situations where the type inference engine doesn't have enough information to infer the type uh, that belongs in place of the underscore. So a typical example of that is uh, if we wanted to define a synonym for nil. Nil takes a type argument, but it, the type argument that it takes is not constrained by anything about the nil constructor itself because, uh, because nil only wants a type argument. It doesn't take any further arguments uh, whose types have to be consistent with the type that, uh, that you pass it. So that is, nil can be, can be used, can be applied to any type to describe the empty list of elements of that type. Uh, and so if we try to simply define a, a, a synonym for nil as on the first line, it will fail. 
And the reason is that that nil on the right-hand side implicitly has an underscore after it, but, with, but there isn't enough information locally to decide what the value of that underscore could be, should be. And the definition, the top-level definition, demands that all the underscores be, uh, be resolved before the definition can be completed. Why is it manual um, with the type arrow in front of it? Uh, um, say it again. Ah, so, so why can't we just leave the type free and figure it out later as we would do in ML or Haskell? Uh, because that's not the way Koch does it. So Koch demands that all underscores, I, I could give a more technical answer, but, uh, but it, it wouldn't be helpful. So for the moment, that's just the way it is. Top level definitions uh, must be completely resolved and not polymorphic. Um, uh, excuse me, they, they can be polymorphic in the sense that they can have explicit for alls, but not uh, free type variables or unification variables hanging around still needing to be resolved. Um, so how can we provide the information that's needed? One way is the information can come from the context. So if we declare my nil colon list nat, now when we're checking nil, we do have enough information to resolve what the underscore has to be uh, by unification. Or uh, if we don't feel like doing it that way, there's another way, which is put an at sign in front of the nil, which turns off the automatic insertion of underscores. So, uh, so at nil has type for all x, list of x, uh, and now we can define uh, you know, my nil prime to be at nil uh, applied to something, or if we like, we can just define it to be a synonym for at nil, and then my nil prime will be polymorphic in the same way that nil is. Okay. Now that we have argument uh, type argument synthesis, we can define nice uh, infix and uh, around fix syntax for lists. Uh, as we had before, so, uh, so empty brackets is just nil, and brackets with, uh, with some things in them uh, have uh, consists, and you can see that the dot dot notation uh, inside of the notation command is used to define kind of nested uh, notations in, uh, in an obvious way. Okay, and now we can write lists just in the form one semicolon, two semicolon, three in the way that we would expect. All right, uh, let's do a few of these very quickly. So uh, I'll give you like five seconds to think about each one. And then I'm just gonna ask for people to yell it out. So, uh, so what, what is the answer here? One, is it one? Four. Four, why? Because in cock we use semicolons, not commas. All right, so that was a trick question. <laughs> <laughs> How about this one? Uh, what, what is comma then in Coke? Uh, comma is used for, uh, for things like pairs. It's also used for, like the after a for all, you put a comma. Uh, so I think it's probably that that made the parsing of lists with commas tricky, but I'm not sure. Okay, what about this one? Uh, take a look and think about it for a second, and then yell it out. What is it? One. One, yes. So this is the list con consisting of the singleton list, seven, appended to the singleton list, nothing. And both of those can be lists of numbers. Okay, and this one? Two, Two or four, which is it? Four. four. <laughs> Four is the correct answer. Why? Because we're appending here two things, one of which is not a list, it's Boolean. If we had replaced those two pluses by colons, then we'd be fine. Okay, what about this? One or four, which is it? <laughs> uh, I'm gonna go for four. Four because, what is this? This is a list 
the first element of which is a number and the second element of which is a list, lists in Koch are homogeneous. So all of the elements of the list have to be the same type. Of course, we can create types that have different alternatives. We've seen that with many inductive type declarations. So if we wanted to have a list whose elements could be either a number or a list, uh, we could do that by defining a, uh, an inductive type with one constructor for numbers, one for lists, and then, and then making that be the homogeneous type of this list. But we'd have to do that a uh, little bit of extra work. I saw a question. Please. OK. If that was an L and not a 1. Uh, sorry. Uh, if it was an L and not a 1, then we might be in better shape. Uh, and I apologize for the, uh, the potential confusion there. So when I ask Cobb to check an expression, does it normalize it and you add compute it? And then excellent, excellent question. So does Cock normalize or, or compute an expression that we write before it tries to type check it? No. Uh, it just, like most programming languages, just checks the expression that you gave it. Okay, and what about this one? Okay, this is a list of lists of numbers. And what about this one? Four, four. four or two? Let's think about it. So uh, this is a list of numbers const on to a list of lists of something. And that sounds okay. So, uh, so we can put it together and we get a list of lists of numbers. So it's two. And what about this one? Three. Right, remember at takes away the automatic, uh, uh, synth uh, automatic insertion of uh, underscores to be filled in. So at nil has type for all x, list of x, and then supplying an argument bool gives us a list of bool. And what about this? Four. This is bad. And what about this? Also bad. Four is the answer. So three is not a type. Three is not a type. And that's why this is bad. Three belongs to a type, but that's not the same as being a type. OK, so, so much for lists. We can do the same thing for pairs. And I'm going to zip through this because it's easy. So, uh, so here is the type of polymorphic pairs. Uh, and that type is written x times y. And, uh, and is often called the product type. Uh, why is that? Well, if you think about it, how many elements does x star y have? Supposing that x and y are, are finite types. Uh, the, uh, the type of pairs of x and y will have the, the product of those numbers of elements. So, <clears throat> so the by extension, this, this is usually called the product type in, uh, in type theory. There is a pernicious and, uh, and subtle and easy confusion to get into between <coughs> x times y and the pair xy. Because we can compute at the level of types, this expression makes perfect sense. It's the pair of the types x and y. This is the type of pairs of an x and a y. What's the, difference? the difference is this uh, classifies values that look like the pair constructor applied to an x and a y. This doesn't classify anything. Uh, it's a data structure at the level of types, uh, which is a sl slightly funny thing that, uh, that we'll come back to later. So it's a, it's a pair of two types. All right, we can now define polymorphic versions of our functions over pairs, like first and second. Um, I'm going to skip that. 
and let's talk about options. So options, remember we had nat option, we can have polymorphic options, just like ML and Haskell. So the type option takes an argument x, and, uh, and the sum constructor takes an x as argument and produces an option x. The none constructor just is an option x. Uh, and now we can define things like nth uh, with, its, uh, with its error result uh, as elements of option x. Okay, so, so much for polymorphism. That's, uh, that's all I'm going to say about polymorphism unless there are questions. Second topic for this chapter is functional programming in the sense of using functions as data. We've already seen that functions have types that suggest that they should be allowed to be used as data. That is, you could make a list of nat eru bool functions uh, and maybe take the head of that list and then apply it to some argument. Um, and so the purpose of this bit of this chapter is to show how that works in, uh, in Gawk. And nothing about this is going to surprise anybody that's used to programming in ML or Haskell or Scheme. Okay, <clears throat> so here is our first higher order function. It is a polymorphic higher order function, so it takes an, a type argument x, it takes a function from x to x, it takes a value of type x, and it applies that function f three times to the provided value n. So do it three times, uh, has type for all x, x arrow x in parentheses, arrow x, arrow x. In other words, it takes three arguments. The first is a type, the second is a function, and the third is a suitable argument to that function. And now we can use do it three times to say negate true three times, that gives us false. And we could use it uh, with other data of, uh, of other types also. For example, do it three times using the minus two function and the starting argument nine gives us back three. Okay, do it three times is not a very interesting higher order function. A much more interesting higher order function is filter. So filter takes a type x, a predicate or a test for x's that returns a Boolean and a list of x's and it returns us the list of those elements of the provided list that satisfy the test. So filter even b and the list 1, 2, 3, 4 gives us back the even elements of that list. Uh, okay. And as you know, those of you that are functional programmers, uh, the filter function to, together with some other functions that we'll see in a minute, uh, allows us to kind of put together definitions uh, over the, that operate with lists without ever mentioning the elements of the lists. So for example, count odd members can be defined without ever mentioning the elements of the list because all we have to do is uh, filter out the odd members of the list and take the length. So we don't need to bother with any, you know, fiddling around with list elements or recursing down the list or, uh, or anything like that. We just put together these, uh, these functions that we've already defined. And this is the essence and the power of the functional programming style. So all of the functions that we've seen have been given names. Do all functional values have to have names? No. You can just write down a function as a piece of data without bothering to give it a name, just as you can write down a number, 57, without bothering to give it a name. So the way we do that is using the anonymous function syntax, fun, and then we give the, a name for the variable that's the argument to the function, and then an arrow, in ASCII it's written with an equal greater than, uh, and then the body of the function. So here we're writing down the square function without bothering to give it a name because uh, in this example, what we need it for is to pass it as an argument to another function. 
So we're just, uh, we're just giving it right there. Uh, and, I have a question. yes, please. Uh, can, you, can you do a nullary anonymous function? Can you write a nullary anonymous function? No. Okay. Uh, what you can do is you can write an anonymous function that takes an argument that you don't care about. For example, that takes an argument from some like trivial type that only has one element anyway. Uh, we might call that type unit. Um, and, uh, and that's the way we would write it. Uh, the reason is, so why, why, why wouldn't we want to be able to write nullary anonymous functions? Because in Coq, Coq is a pure language. Uh, the, the functional programming part of Coq is a, is a pure language. Therefore, uh, the difference between an anonymous function and just the right-hand side of it is no difference. So in OCaml, OCaml, uh, even, even in the pure subset of OCaml, uh, you have things that, won't, that don't terminate. So the difference between an expression that might not terminate and an anonymous abstraction, a thunk, uh, that, that returns that, uh, the, the result of that expression when you apply it to something or when, when, you, when you ask for its result is a big difference. In Coq, it's not such a big difference because, you know, yes, it's a little difference maybe in, uh, in efficiency, because if you don't really want the, uh, the result of the expression until later, uh, uh, you, may, uh, you may want to delay the computation. But leaving that aside, there's really no difference between, uh, between a function that takes a trivial argument and throws it away and computes some answer and just the expression that gives you the answer. Another favorite higher order function is called map. So map is a function that takes two type arguments, x and y. It takes a function f from x to y and a list of x's and it returns you a list of y's. How could it do that? Well, in pretty much the only possible way. By recursing down the list of x's and for each one applying f to it and consing together the results into a list of results. Okay, what is the type of map? Okay, shout it out. Three, lots of votes for three. Why is it not one? Yeah, because so, we're missing some parentheses. So this type three says uh, this is one argument and its type is a function. This says there are two arguments, one of type X and one of type Y, and that's not what we mean here. Can't I curry that get something equivalent? Uh, can't you curry it and get something equivalent? No. Uh, we're coming back to currying in a minute, so, so save that question. Um, let's see, I'm going to skip that. All right, here is another favorite higher order function. It's called fold. Uh, it takes types x and y. It takes a function that takes an x and a y and returns a y. And it takes a list of x's. And it takes a y. And it returns a y. Okay, those of you that have already seen this uh, are saying, oh yes, oh yes, let's go on. Those of you that have not seen it are saying, what on earth is this thing? Uh, okay, what it is is, well, one, one way to think of it is uh, if you're familiar with MapReduce, as in Hadoop and uh, every other framework for large-scale uh, distributed web queries, this is the reduce part. So fold is the reduce function. It takes a list of things, and the way to think about it is it takes a list of things and it takes a binary function and it plops that binary function down between each of the things, and then it puts one more use of it and a B at the end, just in case the list was empty. <clears throat> so, for example, if we, fold 
the times operation over the list one, two, three, four, and the starting value one, what we get is one times two times three times is, sorry, one times one times two, or maybe, let's see, which way do we define it? Probably one times two times three times four times one. Uh, and if we fold and over a list of Booleans and the starting Boolean true, we get false because there's a false in that list someplace and if there wasn't, we would get true and so on. So fold is an extremely useful uh, combinator for building. In fact, in some sense, it's a universal combinator. It's the, the most fundamental combinator for, uh, for building uh, higher order functions out of other ones. Okay. Um, Skip those. When you say fold is a universal combinator, can you make, is there a way to make that precise? Yeah, so, so when I say fold is a universal combinator, uh, is there a way to make that precise? Yes. Uh, it gets into uh, the content of lots of ICFP papers. Um, but let's see if there's a simple way to say it. Um, well, the fold is the is the iterator essentially for the uh, for the type of lists. So, uh, so you can think of it as analogous to the um, to the induction schema for that type. And just as you know, induction can be used to prove pretty much everything to prove pretty much everything you want to prove about lists, fold can be used to write pretty much everything you want to write about lists. Can I use um, so can you use some kind of reflection mechanism to automatically induce the catamorphism from the inductive definition? Uh, I'm going to pass on that question, uh, except to observe that you don't need it because, uh, because it's already built in. It's already what you get. Um, let's go on. Okay. All right, so we've seen functions that take functions as arguments. If functions are truly first class, then we should also be able to write functions that return functions as their results, and we can. So here, for example, is a kind of silly definition that takes a value x and, and gives you back a function that, no matter what number you give it, gives you back x. Uh, so, is there more to say about that? No, it's not very interesting. Um, here is a more interesting observation. Plus is already a function that returns a function. Why? Well, we can see it already in its type. What is its type? Nat, arrow, nat, arrow, nat. But arrow is a binary operator, so we need some parens in that type. Implicitly, there are, there are some parens in that type. Where are they? Well, they're, they're not around the first arrow. They're not around the first nat arrow nat, because that would mean that plus is a one argument function, and we know that it isn't. So they're around the second nat arrow nat. And so what does that mean? It means that plus is a one argument function that, when applied to one argument, gives you back a one argument function that, when applied to one argument, gives you back a number. And that's actually exactly right. It's consistent with the way we write uh, plus expressions. We write plus applied to something and then applied to another thing. So the, the fact that application of functions to arguments in Coq doesn't have any parens around the arguments is completely consistent with the fact that functions are written uh, without any parens around the arguments in the function type. And so what this means, though, is that when we apply plus, we can choose to apply it to two arguments, that's what we've been doing, or we can choose to apply it to less than two arguments. We can, we can apply it to one argument, we can so-called partially apply it, to just one argument, and that will give us back, so say plus applied to three, will give us back the function that takes one number and adds three to it. And we can do things with that function like apply it three times, or map it over a list, or uh, whatever else.
Okay. End of polymorphism and higher order functions. Any questions about that? Let's talk about tactics. In the last chapter, we didn't talk much about proving things. There are some exercises uh, that, uh, that you can do, but it's really kind of just the same as proving things about, um, about lists of numbers and numbers themselves and so on. So we have a, we've, we've introduced complexity, we've, inter we've introduced flexibility in the way that we can write things down. We've in introduced uh, ability to, uh, to make definitions much, more, uh, much shorter and more reusable. But the way we reason about them hasn't changed. <clears throat> the next chapter, we're not going to introduce any new programming facilities, but we are going to introduce a whole bunch of new ways of reasoning uh, that, uh, that, we can, uh, that are useful. OK, first useful thing. So what are the reasoning principles we've seen so far? We've seen rewrite. We've seen reflexivity. And we've seen induction, and we've seen destruct, which is kind of a, a degenerate case of induction. Uh, the next one is apply. Apply says, if we've already established some theorem, uh, and the thing that we're trying to prove now matches the theorem that we already proved, then we're done. So for instance, suppose we're trying to show for some reason, that if we know n is equal to m, and we know that n, the list n o is equal to the list n p, then uh, we know that n o is equal to m p. All right, why does that make sense? It's kind of a silly theorem, but it makes sense because we know two things, and if we substitute one equality in the other, uh, then um, Sorry, I'm standing too close to read. <clears throat> okay, so we can, we can do this by rewriting, but we can also do it just by apply. And let me now go over here and get to the tactics file. Okay, so if we do a rewrite, uh, then we see that the, the goal is exactly the same as one of the hypotheses, EQ2. And, uh, and now we could, of course, finish in the way that we have before. We could do one more rewrite, and then we'd have, uh, and then we'd have something with the same thing on both sides, and then we could say reflexivity. Or we can just finish in one step, by saying apply EQ2. So apply says take something that you already know that matches the goal and use it. Uh, apply is more interesting when we use it with conditional hypotheses. So here, EQ2 uh, is not just an equality, it's, a, it's an equality subject to some hypothesis, so it, it's, a, uh, it's an implication. And it says, for any Q and R, if Q and R are equal, then uh, Q followed by the list QO is equal to the list RP. Once again, don't try to figure out what this means mathematically. It's just a silly example. The reason I want it as an example is to show you that if I apply EQ2 to the, the current goal state, it's going to have to do some, uh, some matching, some pattern matching, uh, some unification, strictly speaking, to, uh, to lay the 
uh, the conclusion of EQ2 on top of the goal and see that they match. Right? Because the goal has an N and an M in it, and, the, and EQ2 has a Q and an R in it. But Q and R are universally quantified in, e, in EQ2. EQ2 works for any Q and R. So I can apply EQ2, and it, uh, and it solves that, uh, that unification problem. Because uh, EQ2 was a conditional hypothesis, it leaves me with a subgoal. So previously when I said apply, it just finished the proof. Here, because EQ2 has a, has a hypothesis, there, there's something that, once we apply it, there's something left to prove, uh, and that takes one more step, which is, uh, in this case, just a use of EQ1. Okay? How does the apply node to work on that uh, proposition, the, the one at the, in the conclusion of... So how does apply no to oh, work? Sorry, never mind. I was looking at something wrong. Okay. <laughs> right. Yeah. Can I? Um, so when you when you do apply EQ two, um, does that take looks at the first part of your conditional? EQ two is a conditional for all Q and R. Uh, if Q equals R, then or Q equals R implies. So it looks at Q equals R and it matches that to N equals M. Um, no, so it, it does exactly the opposite of what you're saying. So, uh, so the question was, uh, how does the how does the pattern matching work when uh, when it's trying to unify EQ2 with uh, with the goal state? Uh, let's go back and look. Ah, sorry. Ugh. So when we say apply EQ2, uh, it looks at the conclusion of EQ2. Looks at the conclusion of EQ2 because it's, it's reasoning backwards. So, uh, so we're trying to show the thing in the goal and we know, the, and we know EQ2. So, uh, so the reasoning that you're doing with apply is you're saying, uh, you're saying uh, we can prove something of the form of the goal assuming Q equals R. So Q equals R is going to become the subgoal. Uh, and in order, to, in order to do that operation, we need to lay the conclusion of EQ2 uh, over the top of the goal state. And then it's the unification process that fills in the appropriate values for Q and R, namely N and M, right. allowing us to go forward the last step. But this strategy is like a implication introduction. I've got to shoot, go from the MC to, to the consequent. Um, it starts with the consequent. Let's go back. It's, it starts with the, well, the, the pattern matching. When you, when you use an apply against the goal state, you're always matching against the, uh, against the conclusion of the thing that you're applying. Ah, okay. So, so could we somehow, uh, instead of working on the goal, could we somehow mash EQ1 and EQ2 together? Uh, yes. And let's see, that might even be next. So uh, hold that question for a minute. Uh, no, it's not quite next, but I'll, I'll, I'll come back to answer that question uh, in a couple of slides. Okay. So... Let me just show you this bit. Okay, here we are. We're trying to show this slightly silly thing. It says, if the list AB equals the list CD and the list CD equals the list EF, then the list AB equals the list EF. And we've, we've already, I skipped over doing it, but, uh, but just above, we have taken the trouble to prove already that equality is transitive. 
So for any NMO, if N equals M and any M equals O, then N equals O. Uh, so it seems like we ought to be able to apply trans EQ uh, to, uh, to solve this goal. And indeed, we can make a little progress. So we can apply trans EQ, uh, sorry, let me just show you, apply trans EQ, oops, uh, yes, excuse me. <coughs> so simply trying to apply trans EQ doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Well, what is the message? You probably can't read it, it's very small. It says, unable to find an instance for the variable M. So what happened? So we tried to unify. So the goal state looked like something equals something. And we tried to unify that with N equals O. Well, N should have been the list AB and O should be the list EF, so what's the problem? And that should unify. Here's the problem. So as far as just laying, laying one on top of the other, it did unify. And, uh, and, and that caused us to realize that uh, the variable, what is it, N must be the list AB and O must be the list EF. But what about M? It can be anything. As far as, as, far as the unification algorithm is concerned, M could be anything. And, uh, and, and, and that will make apply unhappy. In a chapter or two, we'll see a, a more general version of apply that would not get unhappy uh, in this situation and, the, and that's often useful. But apply is picky about this. It says not only the goal state must match the, uh, must unify with the conclusion of the, uh, of the thing that you're trying to apply, but also all of the unification variables that are introduced in that process, namely in this case, uh, X, N, M, N, O, <clears throat> must be determined, must be resolved by that, by that unification. And in this case, M was not. So. Um, Trans eq does have a universal quantifier in the statement. Over, like, over trans eq, if we if we printed the type of trans eq, it would be for all x for all nmo. So trans eq is a is a completely generic theorem. It works for any nmno uh, of any type x. So if we don't do intros M, so like if we, are you saying if we just left out uh, doing the intros of, uh, yeah. well, but we need, well, it wouldn't work anyway because, uh, because we have to intros the same number of things as there are quantifiers that were at the beginning of the goal. But, I see your intuition, but it wouldn't work anyway because uh, because C and D are mentioned other places yeah. uh, around, so we, we have to have names for them. Yeah. Okay. So let me tell you what does work in this example, which is to tell uh, the uh, the apply tactic. Um, here is the value that you need to use for M, and we do that by adding a with clause. like this. So it says apply trans EQ and when you need a value for M, here it is. Okay, and uh, that then makes it easy. Okay, next tactic, please. So, apply is a tactic. With is a tactic transformer? No, apply, 
apply as a tactic and apply with as a tactic is, is the way to think about it. Or with is, a, is an optional argument to apply. Are these, these are not primitives to cop. We're just learning different tactics that are in the equivalent of the um, Apply with is built into cock fairly deeply. Um, let's see. Yeah, the way to think about it is apply is a primitive thing, and apply with is another is a variant of apply. So it's another it's another built-in tactic uh, that takes some extra information and uh, and uses it in the uh, in the process of doing the apply. Please. Ah, can you use the apply with tactic with existential quantifiers? Uh, no, for existential quantifiers you need something else and we'll get to that this afternoon. All right, oh, more questions, yes. Uh, yeah, you probably could just apply trans transec uh, if you left off doing uh, if you left off the last two variables in the in the intros. Let's just try it. I think that will work. So if we left off those, then Because then, so, so why is that? Your, your intuition was correct, um, but just to spell it out for people. So, uh, so transec uh, takes three arguments, NMO, and, uh, and, and, then it's a, uh, and then it gives you a big conditional thing. So, so here the goal state matches the whole big conditional thing not just the conclusion of that condition. Uh, so, uh, so now the unification has more to work with and, uh, and, we, get, and we get all of the variables instantiated. Okay, more questions. Inversion is the next tactic on our list. So, uh, <clears throat> When we give inductive definitions of data types, uh, those definitions have some critical, some crucial properties. For example, for, for NAT, the constructors S and O are disjoint in the sense that uh, the set of, the subset of natural numbers whose top constructor is O is disjoint from the set of natural numbers whose top constructor is S. And that's just obvious thinking of them as trees. Um, but it's a, it's a crucial um, reasoning principle. So, and hence, uh, a natural number that begins with O is never equal to a natural number that begins with S. And that's true of any inductively defined type. The constructors are always disjoint. Moreover, the constructors are always injective. That is, if I have an equality that says successor of x equals successor of y, then I immediately know that x equals y. It's not true for all functions. So certainly if x minus 1 equals y minus 1, it does not follow that x equals y because uh, that would be true of 0 and 1, which are not equal. So it's, only, it's, a, it's a special thing that's true of constructors. <clears throat> and the inversion tactic allows us to invoke uh, these principles of injectivity and disjointness together. Now, something to know about Koch is that because it's been under development for a long time and lots of people have, uh, have done things to it, in general, there are probably six ways to do any given thing in Koch. 
So you might wonder at this point, well, there are two different principles involved here. There's the principle of injectivity and the principle of disjointness. Uh, are there tactics that invoke each one of them separately instead of mashing them together as inversion does? And the answer is yes. Um, and some people prefer to, uh, to write proofs in that style, and some people prefer the bigger hammer of inversion. Um, it's really a question of taste. It's all fine. <clears throat> um, but let me show you inversion. So suppose we want to show, oops, sorry. Don't need that anymore. Yeah. Suppose we want to show that successor is injective. I claimed that it was. Let's write the proof that demonstrates that it is. <clears throat> so if we have a hypothesis that says S of N equals S of M, and we want to know S equals M, uh, N equals M, how do we get that? We use the inversion tactic. Uh, inversion says, take a hypothesis uh, that's an equality between uh, uh, two data structures and kind of pull out everything that we can from that. So in this case, we know from H that N must equal M. And, uh, and therefore, when I do inversion, I get a couple of things. Now, inversion, as I said, is a big hammer. One reason that some people don't like it is that it's such a big hammer that it sometimes uh, does more than you expect. So it's done a couple of things. It's introduced a new hypothesis, H1, that captures the, uh, the, the equality that we were hoping for. And it has already rewritten that equality in the goal state. Uh, and it would have rewritten that equality in the rest of the hypotheses if there were any. So, uh, so actually, we're already done <clears throat> now, that that, uh, now that we've done that inversion. Uh, here is another example, a little bit more interesting. So. Here in H is an equality between two lists. These lists, if you think of them as trees, are kind of deeply nested things. And the inversion will, uh, will keep unrolling uh, the equations that it finds uh, until it's gotten all of the juice out of them. So if we do that inversion, we get two equalities uh, new in the, in the hypotheses. Uh, did it? Yeah. It changes the goal. So it changes the goal state by, by rewriting using those, using those equations. Yes. Um, since it is, uh, since it is generating equations, we might like to have names for those equations. We can, we can get names for those, those equations by, uh, by explicitly saying as blah, blah. So, uh, so rather than H1, H2, we can, uh, we can have it call it HNM or whatever. Uh, let's see, ah, okay, here's something different. So what are we proving here? If BEQ nat 0 n returns true, then n is 0. So this, is, this theorem is doing quite an important thing, actually. It's relating two different notions of equality. It's, re it's relating the built-in notion of equality that says these are the very same tree, these are the same value, with uh, a notion of equality on natural numbers that we defined. And we called it BEQ, but as far as we know up until this point, it might or might not have anything to do with actual equality. So, uh, so this is quite a useful thing to know. So how do we prove it? Well, numbers are inductive things, and BEQ nat is a recursive thing. So we might expect that we need to do some kind of at least destruct uh, on it. Actually, just destruct is enough. <clears throat> because we, re we only really care whether n is 0 or non-zero. So let's do that destruct. Now, in the zero case, all we need to do is 
uh, is reflexivity because the goal already is what we, uh, what we want. The goal, goal is already simple. Uh, but in the inductive case, after simplification, what we get, let's see, sorry, before simplification, what we get is the assumption if zero is equal to successor of n prime, so if, if that calculation yields the Boolean true, then something, something. Uh, but of course, that calculation is never going to yield the answer true. Uh, so, the, so once we uh, once we simplify, we can see that it's contradictory. Once we introduce that into the hypotheses, we're now in a state where we have a contradictory hypothesis. And from that, from a contradictory hypothesis, we should be able to prove anything. So, how do we do that? Well, inversion. Inversion applies the principle of injectivity. We've seen that already, and the principle of disjointness. So here, the principle of, of disjointness says H is contradictory. From, from the assumption H, anything follows. So inversion on H gives us zero subgoals. OK. And this is, of course, an instance of uh, the so-called principle of explosion, uh, sometimes um, the way people name it, uh, which says, if you make a, a nonsensical assumption, then anything follows. So for example, if we assume false equals true, then 2 plus 2 equals 5. Fine. How do we prove it? Exactly the same. Please. Yes, so, so thank you. Precisely, it's, it's nonsensical because true and false are the names of two different constructors from a, uh, from a declared inductive type. Not because they mean anything about truth and falsity or anything like that, just because they're different constructors. Uh, is it possible to introduce cases of an inductive type that are not disjoint? Is it possible to introduce cases of a disjunctive, of a in inductive type that are not disjoint? No. It is inherently part of the inductive type declaration mechanism that the constructors are always disjoint. <coughs> no. Two, constru two, two constructors that are spelled differently are always different, no matter what they're applied to. Please. I, I might have been doing something silly, but I tried to use EQ as a, as a, as a function, a normal function, uh, yesterday, and, and I got an issue. Is it, is it, does it give you that, that equality relation for any inductive type? The, like, the loosest equality relation? Um, let's see, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure I understood the question well enough to uh, say it back. Um, are you saying that, that the, the, e, the e I, equal I, symbol I used as a function is? Uh, I have a question. Oh, okay. Uh, does cock automatically define a function to bool for each inductive type? Very good. So does cock automatically define a function to bool for each inductive type? That is, uh, so we've written down the, the natural number equality, uh, but could cock automatically generate it for us? No, because there are some inductive types, we haven't seen any yet, uh, but there are some inductive types for which equality is not decidable. Uh, so obviously it can't, uh, it can't derive those. Um, there are plugins for cock. Uh, that will automatically derive uh, equality tests for, um, for inductive types that, that do happen to be kind of obviously decidable, like numbers. Um, but uh, but the, the bare cock doesn't have that. Yes? So if you don't like the big hammer, So if you don't like the big hammer, if you don't like inversion, what are the smaller hammers? Uh, I actually forget what all those tactics are called because um, I tend to use inversion. Uh, discriminate and contradiction. Injection. Injection. Discriminate and injection. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Let's go back here. Okay. So to summarize. Uh, inversion is a big hammer that takes an equality, 
uh, notices whether it's an equality between the same constructor or different constructors. If it's different constructors, then it just solves the goal. If it's the same constructor, then it introduces equalities between all of the arguments to the constructors and then repeats and does that recursively as long as, uh, as, long as it can see a constructor on both sides of the equality. All right, let's see. I'm gonna skip over those actually and check how much more we have to do here. Yes, we have quite a bit more. I'm gonna keep going. Okay, uh, here is a useful theorem. It's called F equal and it says, suppose A and B are types and F is a function from A to B and x and y are members of A. Then if we know that x is equal to y, then f of x is surely equal to f of y. <coughs> so this function is not hard to prove. Uh, and it wouldn't be worth writing down at all really, except that it's quite useful for reasoning backwards because Suppose that you want to know that f of x is equal to f, f of y, that's your goal. What will happen if you say apply f equal? Well, it will give you a sub-goal, x equals y. So, uh, so f equal is, is useful for situations where the goal is f of something equals f of something else. And you just want to throw away the f's and say let me show that the arguments are equal. That isn't the only reason why f of something could be equal to f of something else. But if you happen to know or believe that the, that the arguments are equal, that's an easy way of showing it. So f equal is a, uh, is a quite handy tactic for throwing away these f's. In fact, it's so handy that uh, instead of saying apply f equal, you can just say f equal. So there's a tactic called f equal that, uh, that's equivalent to apply f equal. All right, a few more things to tidy up uh, in this chapter. First, the style of reasoning that we've been doing so far is all backwards. So we start with a goal that is the final thing that we want to establish, and then we apply tactics to simplify it, simplify it, simplify it, in some cases break it into distinct cases, uh, or do induction on it, whatever, uh, and uh, and we're always trying to, uh, to solve sub-goals uh, and, uh, and thus eliminate them until we get to a state where there are no sub-goals left. A different style is to reason forward. That is, to introduce into, into the hypotheses all of the, uh, all of the initial assumptions. <clears throat> and then to say, well, which hypotheses can we combine in order to show new things? Uh, and keep kind of reasoning forward in that way uh, until, we, until finally we've established the thing that, that we want as our goal. Um, in Koch, backward reasoning is a little bit the default uh, just by uh, the way the tactic language is structured. But if you, at any given moment, uh, or just temperamentally, prefer forward reasoning, uh, you can do that too. So uh, if you want forward reasoning, what you want is to apply tactics that uh, rather than m m fiddling with the goal state, fiddle with the other fiddle with the hypotheses. And you do that using uh, things like simple in. So most tactics come with an in variant that, <coughs> um, that works on hypotheses instead of the conclusion. So let's find that. So, so suppose we so here's a here's a here's a hypothesis that's a little bit more complicated than I want. Uh, so let's try simplifying it by saying simple in H. Oh, now look, the hypothesis is exactly the same as the as the goal, and now I can just do apply, and I'm done. 
that was a silly example, but uh, but it's a uh, an instance of a general observation that for that you may often get into a state where, <coughs> excuse me, a, a hypothesis is too complicated and you want to do some computation on it to see what's hiding inside. And, uh, and doing simple on it is, uh, is nice. Um, there's also, I think there's a slide on this in a second, but another variant is you can say simple in star. And that means simplify in all the hypotheses and the goal. Uh, we can also do uh, other tactics in hypotheses. So for example, here is, uh, here is symmetry in H. So uh, let's see, why do I want that? I want that because if I swap the sides of H, then I can apply EQ to H. All right, because now H matches the left-hand side of EQ. Why the left-hand side? Because this is forward reasoning, so I'm combining things that I know. Therefore, uh, uh, EQ wants its hypothesis to be satisfied and, and will produce its conclusion. So if I now apply EQ in H, what I'm going to get is uh, the conclusion of EQ replacing H. Please. If you wanted to keep around the original H, if you wanted to keep around the original H, uh, then you would have to duplicate it. And somebody remind me what's the tactic for that? I forget. There is a tactic for copying a hypothesis. Hmm? Remember. Remember. Would do it. Or if you wanted to throw away EQ, you could just specialize EQ with H. Or you could special you could specialize EQ with H uh, as well. So that's that's kind of doing it the other way, replacing EQ instead of replacing H. Uh, and similarly, we can, uh, again, apply symmetry in H. And now we've got the thing that we need. Okay. Going forward. All right, one last little topic in this chapter. Um, when we do induction in caulk as in paper proofs, it's important to, uh, to be able to think about and control the, the induction hypothesis. Because if the induction hypothesis is too strong or too weak or not stated the right way, then the, the inductive proof is not going to work. Uh, and so let me show you a couple of situations where induction hypotheses can get messed up. Here is a double function. So it just recurses down a number and, uh, and doubles it by replacing each s by two s's. And now, suppose we want to show that this function is injective. That is, that if double of n equals double of m, then n equals m. We could start proving this thing. And let me actually go to the proof so you can see what kind of state we get into. So there we are. We do some intros, induction. Uh, now we have some zero cases. They're easy. And now we do intros again. OK, and now here we are. Uh, let's, let's look at this goal. So it says we have to show that successor of n prime equals m. And you can already tell, if you think about it, that we're in trouble because uh, we're trying to prove something by induction, but the the thing that we're the sub goal that we're in does not look like the induction hypothesis. The induction hypothesis is about n prime and m, but the goal is about the successor of n prime and m. So I just don't think that conclusion follows from those hypotheses. So what went wrong? Let me try to generalize what you said. The problem here is that we're talking about lots of different n's, but we're only talking about one single m. And, and that's wrong. 
the, the M that we're talking about needs to change at each level of the induction, just like the N does. <coughs> so the problem is, way back here, before we did induction, we have N and M in the context, but we're doing induction on N, and M here is a constant. Why is M a constant? Well, what did that intros do? So at the beginning, M was not a constant. It was, uh, it was universally quantified. What intros does is it says, pick an arbitrary N and M. So after we've done the intros, now in the hypotheses, we have a particular N and M. We don't know what they are, they're arbitrary, but they're particular things. Now we're reasoning by induction on M, which sort of re-abstracts it, but M stays concrete. And that's what gets us to this mangled state. So what do we need to do? We need to make sure that the induction hypothesis is, has M under a quantifier. And how do we do that? Well, We could do induction on M. That could work instead of M. Oh, I see. We could do induction on N before the intros. Aha. Uh -huh. Will that work? Let's try. Did it work? Yes. Surprises me. Why did that work? <laughs> I thought it was going to not work. Um, maybe induction got smarter. Okay. Okay, so induction got smarter in what cock version? 8.6 <laughs> maybe? Okay. Before 8.6, this would not have worked. <laughs> now it does work. All right, so, uh, so, so my example doesn't work, uh, and I need to go back and fix it, but um, Induction is probably not always smart enough. Uh, so what could we do instead? Well, we could do a couple of things. We could do induction on M, since the whole thing is symmetric. We, we could do induction on M. Or we could change the statement of the theorem to swap N and M. Uh, is that true? Well, in any case, or here is the right way to do it, uh, is to use Oh, sorry, no, no. Uh, sorry, I'm confusing myself. Uh, if we just yeah, sorry. This is the same as what induction now does. All right, I apologize for the confusion. I think if we just rewind and observe that N is the first thing bound. So if we don't do the intros, I think this is even true before 8.6. If we don't do the intros, then, uh, then M, then induction will say, okay, grab that first N and, uh, and do induction on it, N will remain uh, quantified, and that's exactly what we need. Okay, if N and M had been introduced in the other order, then we would have a problem. And then we would need either the new smart induction tactic or, uh, and do I have it here? Yes, we can use a thing called, oh dear, uh, we're almost out of time, we are out of time, so let me not try to get Cock to accept it. I will just go back here and show you this, which is this generalized dependent, which says, so we've done the intros, both N and M are in the context. Generalized dependent says take something that's in the context and move it back into the goal with a quantifier. Uh, so this is the way of controlling the form of the induction hypothesis when we get into a state where, uh, where the variables are too concrete. Okay. Uh, good. One last thing. 
Another thing that can happen sometimes that can, can get a proof stuck is, uh, is that uh, a definition needs to be unfolded. Cock is already a little bit smart about unfolding definitions, so it will, it will automatically do a bit of unfolding, but it doesn't do very much unfolding. In particular, uh, in this situation, so here's a definition bar of x, match x with blah blah, and now if we try to simplify some equation involving bar, if we try to simplify some, uh, some use of bar, uh, bar always returns five. So if we, would, if we did kind of fully simplify out everything, uh, we would see that this is just uh, an, obvious, uh, an obvious reflexivity. But simple will not do it. Why? Well, simple is a little bit conservative about how much it expands. And the reason is that simple is trying to strike a balance between uh, computing enough to, uh, to expose things that are useful for, uh, for making progress in a proof, but not exposing everything. Because often, we've been dealing with fairly small definitions here, but if the definitions get big, if you compute out everything and reduce it to a totally, uh, totally uh, finished normal form, it will typically be huge. Uh, and then those are hard to reason about. So you don't want to unfold everything. Uh, you just want to unfold a little bit at the outside and simple has, is, is bas basically a heuristic that says, uh, that says if, uh, the, if doing a little bit of unfolding Will, uh, will cause further computation to happen. So if, if unfolding an application, sorry, if unfolding the left-hand side of an application will enable some further computation, uh, then uh, simple will, will do that unfolding and otherwise it won't. In situations where simple isn't doing enough unfolding for you, you can do it manually by saying unfold. So, Here, uh, we are unfolding bar manually to, uh, to, uh, to make progress. Okay, now let's see, a couple more things here. Uh, I'm gonna leave you to read for yourself this, uh, this last bit. Uh, no, let me just say it really quickly. So, destruct uh, can be used, so destruct, remember, takes an equality and, uh, and examines how it came to be. Uh, and gives you a, no, no, sorry. That's inversion. Destruct takes a, an element of an inductively defined type and gives you a case analysis. An element of an inductively defined type could be a single variable or it could be a compound expression that just happens to return a number or a color or whatever. Destruct will work with both, but destruct throws away the expression that you destructed. And sometimes that will leave you in a stuck state. So, uh, let's see. Here is an example where it does work. And here is an example where it doesn't work. And, uh, and the reason is that at some point in the proof, uh, you need to know that uh, uh, some, some, you need to know that the, the thing you destructed on, that the expression you destructed is equal to true or equal to false. And you don't have that equality. So how can you get that equality? By saying uh, destruct, and then there's a, uh, a little optional bit that's eqn colon, and you can give a name. So, uh, so this <coughs> eqn colon stuff uh, gives you a hypothesis with the equality that you would be missing otherwise. Okay, that's a, I know that's fast, but just to give you a preview of what you can read in the chapter. And then one last thing, uh, which I will say very quickly. Um, mindless proof hacking is a lot of fun in caulk, you can, uh, you can get a long distance in caulk without thinking at all. 
And it's actually a pretty useful strategy. So it is a terrible temptation, and you shouldn't always resist. But if after five minutes you realize that you're going in circles or uh, you haven't made progress or you have absolutely no idea what's going on, then you should step back and try to think. So, so the typical mode is uh, a, a typical cock user sitting at their keyboard does not have their brain engaged all the time. They're just uh, pattern matching, applying tactics, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but at some point, uh, something unexpected happens or they get stuck and they say, oh, I have to re-engage brain. And, uh, and then you have to actually look and see, okay, what, what is this really saying? Do the, does the conclusion follow from the hypotheses? Is something mangled? Uh, so you need to develop the skill uh, of realizing when you need to re-engage your brain and, uh, and how to look at the state and figure out how you got into a mangled state or if the state is mangled. Um, one really useful way is to go back to good old pencil and paper. So my, my recommendation for you is set yourself a time limit. Five minutes is a, is a good amount. If you've been proceeding without thinking and, and don't seem to be making progress for five minutes, then stop. Actually set your laptop aside, take out a piece of paper, uh, and attempt to prove the thing that, that you're trying to do with caulk informally in the usual way that you've been used to on paper. Uh, and that will almost always teach you how to go back and, and do it the formal way. Okay, and with that, it's time for lunch. And uh, we start in the afternoon at? Uh, so after the lunch, there's this, this homework session where I can oh, yeah, sorry. practice that skill. <laughs> okay, um, so we can practice hacking and thinking. <laughs> uh, and instead of seeing TAs, first try to use the pencil and paper. Yeah. Um, and then there's coffee break again at 3, and uh, the last session is at 3.30. Okay, so, the, so the, uh, the, the homework session starts officially at what well, right time? Right after lunch. Right after exactly. lunch. Whenever you're finished so with lunch, lunch, come back here, uh, work on problems. And uh, you'll, you've already seen, but there are optional problems and ordinary problems and advanced problems. The ordinary pro Try to do all of the ordinary problems. If those seem easy, then try to do some advanced problems. Uh, but try to get through those two chapters uh, so that you are up to speed when, when Ben begins uh, at the end of the afternoon.